الحمد لله وكفى وصلاة وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض We greet you brothers and sisters and friends from here in my sitting room in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia with the universal greeting of peace assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh as we uh, seek to address you on the subject of such paramount importance to Russia namely Islam and Russia's tryst with destiny we from the world of Islam who receive our guidance and uh, <coughs> our explanation about the reality from the blessed Quran the holy Quran and from the blessed prophet Muhammad Allah's peace and blessings be upon him we have a perception uh, of Russia that the Russian people would be very interested to learn about. The Quran addresses us uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah and uh, tells us that a time will come when we will most certainly find those who will have the greatest hatred and hostility an enmity for us Muslims to be those to be, to, to be the Jews as well as those who are hell-bent on blasphemy shirk the verse of the Quran and we would particularly invite those who are attracted to Isis who believe that ISIS is the best thing that has ever occurred in modern Muslim history and who want to join the ranks of ISIS in that jihad, they call that it a jihad, I call it a bogus jihad, we would invite you to sit down and listen to the Quran so that you might wake up from your sleep. Ba'adawuzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Latajidanna ashaddan nasi adawatan لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودِ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا You will most certainly find in time to come that those who will have the greatest hatred and hostility and enmity for you would be Jews. When the Quran speaks of Jews, it is not speaking about all Jews. No, that's wrong methodology. It is speaking about some Jews, not all Jews. You will find that those who will have the greatest hatred for you would be Jews. And that's clear today that the Jewish state of Israel is exhibiting more than just hatred for Muslims. <coughs> it is acting in a barbarian way. But the Quran goes on to speak about those who are hell-bent on manifesting and projecting shirk or blasphemy. And that is precisely the conduct of those who control power in the world today, in Washington, in London, in Paris, in Germany, etc. The Anglo-American Zionist Judeo-Christian Alliance are the ones who are hell-bent on projecting blasphemy and embracing all of mankind with blasphemy or shirk. There are many examples of it that we can give to you. But we've done that in so many previous lectures of ours. But then after having spoken about those who would at that time have this greatest hatred for us Muslims, the Quran then goes on to say that at that time you will find something else. nasara. <laughs> that you will most certainly find at that time when the Jews exhibit the greatest hatred of all, at that time you will find 
that those who are closest of all to you Muslims in love and affection will be those who say, we are Christians. This is not Imran Hussein speaking. This is the Quran. And we invite you who are supporters of ISIS, who are supporters of the bogus Islamic State and bogus Caliphate, who are acting just as barbarian in your conduct as those who rule the world today. We invite you to listen to the Quran. Who are those Christians, we ask you, and we want an answer from you. Who are those Christians who at that time, when the Jews are most hostile of all to you, would be the closest of all to you in love and affection. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمُ الْكِسِّسِينَ وَرُحْبَانَ وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ The reason why they have the greatest love and affection for you is because they are not an arrogant people. No, those who rule the world today are an arrogant people. They believe that they have a divine right to civilize the rest of us in the world, the brown-skinned people. But they are the most civilized people. They have a chip on their shoulders and they give us this jingoistic cry that they have come to civilize the world. That's arrogance. But these Christians are not like that. No. They are humble. They are not arrogant, says the Quran. And they also hold on to the institution of monasticism and the priesthood. Monasticism is disappearing in Western Christianity. Oh, yes. So where is monasticism still surviving amongst Christians today? We are inviting you to listen to us before you go and join ISIS in that bogus jihad. Listen to the Quran. Who are those Christians? We can easily identify the Jews who are hostile to Muslims today. We can easily identify those who are pursuing the agenda, agenda of shirk. They are those who are ruling the world today. But who are those about whom the Quran is speaking at this time, when the Jews are most hostile, who are those Christians at this time who are closest in love and affection for us Muslims, who are not an arrogant people, no, and who are still holding on to the institution of monasticism. Will you answer me before you go and join ISIS? Can you answer us? Do you have the stomach to answer us? Forgive my frustration at these Muslim youth who have eyes and yet cannot see. They have ears and yet cannot hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. They're just like cattle. <laughs> Allah has warned, your blindness is not going to be an excuse on Judgment Day. Large numbers are destined for Jahannam because they have, they have eyes and yet cannot see. So we are speaking to you today to open your eyes. Who are those Christians? Who are those Christians? Who are closest in love and affection for us Muslims? who are not an arrogant people and who are holding on to the institution of monasticism, the monasteries and the monks. Does the Quran help us to answer this question? Before we go and search outside, let us go to the Quran. Yes, the Quran does speak to us and help us to answer the question by eliminating a certain part of the Christian world. Where does it do so? It does so in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the same Surah Al-Ma'idah. And kindly forgive me for having to come back to this verse of the Quran again and again and again and again and again. 
because those who are attracted to ISIS, they just can't hear me. They just will not come to the Quran. They run from the Quran. So you're not a Muslim worthy of anything at all. If you are running from the Quran, why run from the Quran? Come on and listen to the Quran. Allah gives a command, doesn't He? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, the one God. La tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Obviously, Allah could not be speaking about those Christians who, have the, who are closest of all in love and affection for us Muslims. No, he has to be speaking about some other Christians. Not all Christians. Did you hear me? Those of you who are attracted to ISIS, Allah could not be speaking about all Christians. Why? Because he just said that you will certainly find in time to come that those who will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims will be those who say we are Christians. So when he gives a command, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies, he could not be speaking about all Christians. Do you understand that? Why is it so difficult for you to come to the Quran? You run to join ISIS, but you will not come to the Quran. My language is harsh today. My voice is thunderous today because I'm frustrated at these blind mice who just keep running to ISIS and say they're good Muslims. No, they're not. A good Muslim is one who thinks Allah sent the Quran لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ But you will not think. So today your brother Imran or your uncle Imran is trying to help you to think. If Allah is not speaking about all Christians, then he could not be speaking about all Jews. When he says, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. So now we ask the question, will you not answer me? Which Christians is Allah speaking about? Which Jews is Allah speaking about? When he says, don't take the Jews and don't take the Christians as your friends and allies. The answer is right there in the words which follow. Allah says, Meaning, and if you have a better an explanation of the ayah, please send it to me. Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. So which Christians and which Jews are friends and allies of each other today? Do we have a Jewish Christian alliance in the world today? Are you sleeping? Will you not wake up? Will you not recognize that Allah is talking about the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance? Why are you afraid of the Quran? Why do you run from the Quran, but you run to join ISIS? Come to the Quran. The Quran is speaking about a Judeo-Christian. Judeo means Jewish. The Quran is speaking about a Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance, which today holds power in the world. So those Christians are eliminated from the answer, meaning Western Christianity, which is in alliance 
with the Zionist Jews supporting the state of Israel, which have NATO as their military arm, but the so-called Islamic government in Turkey apparently doesn't study the Quran because they are comfortable as members of NATO. I've never ever heard the Turkish government, the present Turkish government, speak even a whisper about it being incompatible with the Quran to be members of NATO. Will they ever say that? Do they have the guts to speak? Do they have the integrity to speak as Muslims and to say no? Turkey should not be a member of NATO. It is in conf conflict with the Quran. Is that Islam? Is that the Islam that you are supporting? Is that the Islam that you are so um, happy about? Well then, now we know that the Christians who are going to be closest in love and affection to Muslims at that time when the Jews are most hostile to Muslims, which is today, would not be Western Christianity. Is there another Christianity in the world which is not in alliance with the Zionists? Go ask the Christians of Greece. Go ask the Christians of Bulgaria. Go ask the Christians of Armenia. Go ask many of the Christians in Romania. And go ask the Christians of Russia. And they will tell you very, very quickly we are not in alliance with the Zionist Jews. No. And we are holding fast to the institution of monasticism. The Quran refers to these Christians. Do you know that? There's a whole surah of the Quran about them. Do you know that? Those of you who are joining ISIS, will you not listen? There is a surah of the Quran called Surah to Rum. And in that surah, Allah speaks about Rum. It is at the beginning of the surah. The word Rum occurs only once in the whole Quran. And he says, Ghulibati Rum. Rum has been defeated. I know that I have quoted these verses of the Quran several times in the past. And some of you may be tired that I am repeating. But what can I do if the people who want to join ISIS, they have ears and they can't hear? Don't I have to repeat? So that some of them at least would have some integrity and come to the Quran before they go to join ISIS? Ghulibatir Rum. Rum has been defeated. Defeated in what? A game of chess? No, defeated in war. So we're not talking about a church, about a monastery. We're talking about an army. A state which wages war. Ghulibatir Rum. Fi al Rum has defe been defeated in a land close by. Close by to where? Close by to where the Quran was revealed to Arabia. So it could be Washington. Huh? No, it can't be Washington. It can't be NATO. Rome has been defeated in a land close by. But Allah is conveying news about the future. The Quran is declaring that there is something coming in the future, not the distant future. No, the immediate future, in a few years from now. That Rome is going to reverse the defeat and will be victorious. This is a prophecy, a divine prophecy. Lillahi al-amr min qabl wa min ba'd. Decision making, the command is with Allah. The first time when Rome was defeated. And the second time when Rome will be victorious. It is Allah who decides upon victory and defeat. 
But on that day when Rome is victorious, guess what will be the response of the Muslims? On that day, the believers, those who have faith in Allah, which is synonymous here with Muslims, will celebrate. So the Quran establishes a positive relationship. We are not talking about military history here. We're talking about the Quran. So show respect for the Quran, please. Don't bring any extraneous matters to it. Allah is speaking in the Quran. Will we not show respect for the Quran? That on that day when Rome is victorious, the Muslims will celebrate. So the Quran establishes a positive relationship, a friendly relationship, a loving relationship between Muslims and one part of the Christian world which is called Rome. Who is Rome? Answer, Rome is Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity does not celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Didn't you know that? That's not Orthodox Christianity, that's another Christianity which has allied himself, themselves with the Jews and who have given to the world Santa Claus. But Orthodox Christianity doesn't have Christmas on December 25th. No, they have their Christmas in early January. Orthodox Christianity is Rome. And it is Orthodox Christianity that Allah is speaking about. Room that he's speaking about when he says that at that time, at that time, when the Jews are most hostile of all to you, at that time you will find Orthodox Christians coming to you as closest of all in love and in affection. Is this so difficult for you to understand? How many times must I repeat it? People are fed up now, Imran Hussein, repeating and repeating and repeating. Who is the leader of Rome today? Is it Greece? The Greek always remind us that they had built Hagia Sophia when Christianity has not yet reached Russia. And when the Russians wanted to know which religion to join, when the delegation came to Constantinople and they saw Hagia Sophia, they were so impressed that they went back and reported and Russia decided to join Orthodox Christianity. The Greek never tire in telling us they were Christians before the Russians. But today, the leader of the Orthodox Christian world is indeed Russia. Russia is the biggest, the most powerful leading nation in the Orthodox Christian world. So Russia is the leader of Rome today. If the CIA, have you heard me? If the CIA sends weapons and arms, and before that, it was Britain doing it, Britain sending weapons to Imam Shamil. Britain sending weapons and sending money to Imam Shamil in the Caucasus to launch a rebellion against Russia, Tsarist Russia. Hmm? If Britain is and, and the United States of America are doing the dirty work of providing the weapons and providing the training and providing the financing as they're doing now for this bogus ISIS. And Russia responds to protect itself from this attack that is being launched through Muslims by the United States and Britain. Are you going to blame Russia for seeking to protect itself? When the CIA comes to stab you in the back at Grozny with the Chechens? 
Even the Chechens themselves admit that they were getting weapons from the CIA, from the Americans. So you're going to hold that against Russia? No, the Russians are absolutely correct in protecting Russia from this attack which is being launched by the CIA using Muslims. Muslims who have eyes and can't see because Allah prohibits you from taking weapons from the Americans and therefore from Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So therefore, we have come to the conclusion that between Islam and Russia there is a link. The link is that the Quran recognizes Orthodox Christians or Rum to be those who at this time in history would be the closest in love and affection for Muslims. That is already taking place. I told you I went to Russia, I went to Moscow last July and I spoke at the State University of Moscow and I got a very respectful and a very friendly welcome and response and I was invited to come again. And since I spoke in Moscow and since my lectures have been coming on the internet, I'm receiving emails from all over the Orthodox Christian world. All of them showing their approval and their fondness for this exposition of Islam that they're hearing from me, so different from Ottoman Islam, which waged relentless, unjust war, bogus jihad against Rome, Orthodox Christians, for 500 years on behalf of Dajjal. Now that we've established a positive relationship between Islam, the religion, and Russia, the leader of Rome today, now we can proceed with our subject of Islam and Russia's tryst with destiny. The Western world, the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance have been targeting Russia for the longest while, even before the Zionist movement had been established. They were already targeting Russia. The Crimean War was fought before the Zionist movement was established. The Crimean War was the last effort that they made in warfare to try to crush Russia. And they did defeat Russia in the Crimean War, but Russia was able to survive and to turn the table within a few years. Russia was able to hold on to Crimea in the Crimean War, but with severe limitations on her use of Crimea as a naval port. But within a few years, Russia was able to turn the tables, and Russia survived. Russia survived the First World War, although Russia took the brunt of fatalities in the First World War. But at the conclusion of the First World War, they attacked Russia. The allies of Russia attacked Russia. They were the ones who launched the Bolshevik Revolution to stab Russia in the back. When the Russian troops were within an arm's length of Constantinople, and the alliance had made a pact, an agreement, that Russia would get Constantinople. But they didn't want to Russia to get Constantinople. They say one thing with their lips, but in their heart there's something else. And so when the Russian troops were close to Constantinople, they launched the Bolshevik Revolution, which was done by Russian Jews. That's well known. And then the, the new Bolshevik government took Russia out of the war. Why? When the Russian troops are at arm's length from Constantinople, why do you take Russia out of the war? The answer is because the Bolsheviks do not want Russia to get Constantinople. That's why. And up to this day, they don't want Russia to get Constantinople. That's why. So they have to do whatever they can do to weaken Russia. So they gave Russia the Bolshevik Revolution and then the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union in the most Christian of all states, Russia, Holy Russia, 
Holy Russia, why do I use the word holy? Because Russia is so pious in its affection for Christianity. That's why you dumb dumb. You can't understand why I'm using the word holy. Russia is the most sincere of all in its attachment to Christianity. This, the heart of Russia is spiritual. The heart of Russia, of, of, of Washington and London, is barbarian. But the heart of Russia is spiritual. But that's too difficult for you to understand, so you go and join ISIS. That's, what, that's where you belong. Russia is intensely Christian. So they brought the Soviet Union as an atheist state to destroy Christianity. Is that so difficult for you to understand? The Zionist, the, the Soviet Union was at its heart a Zionist plant. Even though the Soviets did not themselves realize it. The Zionists were at the heart of it. And for some 60, 70 years, the Soviet Union crushed and crushed and crushed the Orthodox Christian Church in Russia to destroy Russia. But Russia survived. It was the, the Zionist Soviet Union that set the trap for Russia when they handed over Crimea to Ukraine in 1952. Why did they hand over Crimea to Ukraine? Why? Will you not ask yourself before you join ISIS? The reason why they handed over Crimea to Ukraine, although Crimea is Russian territory, without asking the people of Russia for their permission, without speaking to the people of Crimea. No, the Soviet Union did nothing of the sort. They just handed over Crimea to Ukraine in order to set the stage for a day which is to come when Russia will be cut down to size and will pose no threat at all to anyone. And then came the time when the, they didn't need the Soviet Union anymore. They had done all the dirty work they wanted it to do, include forcing, forcing Turkey to join NATO. That's what the Soviet Union did. Then they dismantled the Soviet Union with the color revolution. They did it. So that when the Soviet Union was dismantled, then all the former states of the Soviet Union which were not a part of the Russian Federation, could now be invited to join NATO. But the biggest plum of all was Ukraine. They wanted Ukraine in NATO. They finally got a coup d'etat. <laughs> they made on demonstrations and the snipers who shot people, mercenaries out there shooting people, to try to overthrow the government. But Washington and London have short memories. They only fixated about an aeroplane that was shot down from the sky, which they know about. They know who did it. And of course, the Malaysians know very well who did it. But they wouldn't talk about who it is who caused the government of Ukraine to be overthrown. The reason why they wanted this regime change in Ukraine is not so difficult to understand. It's a part and parcel of the effort to stab Russia in the back. So that a pro-Western government in Ukraine would then give Russia marching orders out of Crimea. And once Russia is denied Crimea as a naval port, Russia is no longer a superpower because Russia would not have a warm water pot anymore. But they planned their plans. And Allah planned his plans. And it happened in our lifetime. It only happened recently, earlier this year. The most momentous event in the history of the Zionist movement occurred just earlier this year. What was it? Within two weeks, Russia was able to reclaim Crimea without a shot being fired. 
it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant on the part of Russia to get the people of Crimea to choose, and they chose Russia. The parliament, which was a legally elected parliament of Crimea, which was recognized as representative of the people of Crimea, that parliament voted for joining Russia. And then Russia accepted the vote. And so Crimea was restored to Russia. When Crimea was restored to Russia, things changed in the Black Sea. Russia now has no restrictions whatsoever on the use of Crimea. Russian power can now be extended all over the Black Sea, which means all the littoral states. The Russian territorial waters, the Russian economic zone now expands because Crimea is now a part of Russia. So the Black Sea is now a Russian sea. And the first people to realize that things have now changed, the Turkish government. Turkey is still a member of NATO, yes. But Turkey has realized that the strategic environment has changed. And that is why Turkey had to break ranks with NATO at a time when the Europeans are attempting to isolate Russia. At that time, with sanctions, with the Russian ruble reeling, at that time, time Turkey chose to slap them on their face in an agreement with Russia on oil. The agreement on oil and on gas is just part of the big picture. Turkey has sent a message to the world and the message is that Turkey now recognizes the political reality of a change in the strategic environment in that region of the world, the Black Sea, where Russia is now the dominant power. Because the Zionists have suffered their most significant loss and setback in the history of the Zionist movement in Russia's recovery of Crimea. And because time is now on Russia's side, the longer Russia has without a war, the stronger will Russia become. Because Russia can now exploit her control over Crimea to project power in that region of the world, nuclear power. Mr. Putin made the statement, just few words, but they were powerful words. He warned the world, don't mess with nuclear Russia. And the words reached Turkey. And so now I am happy to say to those who listen to me in different parts of the world, that the recent Turkish agreement with Russia on oil and gas is representative of a Turkish recognition of reality that the strategic, strategic environment in that part of the world has now changed in consequence of Russia's recovery of Crimea. Russia is now going to become more and more powerful every day that passes. Their response has been economic sanctions against Russia, financial sanctions against Russia. Shame on you. We in the world of Islam have a different philosophy, economic philosophy. Prophet Muhammad set the example. We in Islam, we never use trade and business as a weapon. Shame on you! 
Shame on you for using trade as a weapon. You should be ashamed of yourself. We have a higher standard than that. We never use economic sanctions against anybody to try to bring about regime change through economic sanctions. No. We never use trade as a weapon and business as a weapon. No. We say, illa an takuna tijaratan an taradim minkum. The trade and business should be transacted in a manner which is mutually satisfying. That's Islam. That's the Quran. That's a much higher standard of conduct than that being demonstrated by these people in Europe, imposing their rotten economic sanctions against people. That's their barbarian philosophy. Can that compare with the refined, beautiful philosophy of Islam, in which we never use trade and business as a weapon? Do you not have sense before you go and join ISIS? Huh? Leaving Islam to go and join ISIS? Do you not have sense? As a consequence of the realization that Russia is now going to become stronger and stronger, they are imposing economic sanctions to try to destabilize Russia. And now we want to pause to speak to the Russian people and to the Russian government if we are to be allowed to offer a word very humbly and yet very sincerely. The monetary system has come from them. They constructed it, not you. They did it at Bretton Woods. And then when Bretton Woods collapsed in 1971, they are the ones who brought the petrodollar monetary system into being in 1973. A petrodollar monetary system about which Nabi Muhammad made a prophecy when he said that it would not be long before the river Euphrates will uncover, the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. The mountain of gold that he's talking about is an ocean of oil, which will one day function as a mountain of gold. An ocean of oil, which will one day function as a mountain of gold. That happened in 1973, when the Saudis were persuaded by Kissinger to agree to sell oil for only US dollars. And so now the US dollar is no longer backed by gold, it is backed by oil. So it becomes the petrodollar. So oil is functioning as gold. That seems to be a little bit too difficult for the Salafi to understand. But perhaps one day understanding will come, inshallah. The petrodollar monetary system is built as an inbuilt mechanism which allows them to attack any currency they want. And all they need is a camouflage to, to camouflage the attack. They did it with Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, with his, his Zimbabwe dollar. They're doing it now with the ruble. And what they did is to use Saudi Arabia to pump more oil into the market to bring down the price of oil. But they didn't need to pump more oil. They, they're able to manipulate the market, to take the price up when they want to bring it down when they want to do that with gold all the time. So they do that with oil. And they're bringing the price of oil down. It is so shamefully naked what they're doing in order to sabotage Russia so that the Russian economy would reel. As the Russian ruble falls in value, Russian prices will go up. It's called inflation. And as the prices keep on going up, the people will become discontented. They will lose favor. The government will lose favor with them. And then you'll have the rioting and so on. You'll have the people demonstrating, which is what they want. They want to bring down the Russian government and they're using this rotten mechanism of inflation. And so we have a word to share. 
with the Russian people and with the Russian government. You cannot beat them at their game. Venezuela, we say the same thing to you. You can't beat them at the game. Bolivia, we say the same thing with you. You can't beat them. Algeria, are you listening to me? Algeria, are you listening to me? You cannot beat them at their game. Where is the Algerian money today? Hmm? The only way you can insulate yourself against this venomous attack of inflation, when they attack your money and the ruble is falling in value. I was in Moscow last year, June, and the ruble was trading at about 33 rubles to one US dollar, which is already bad. And now the ruble is more than 50, maybe going up to 60 or so which is shameful, disgraceful, because it's going to lead to inflation. And inflation is going to lead to public discontent. And public discontent is going to lead to demonstrations. And demonstrations are going to lead to regime change. So then what should you do? How do you get out of this trap? They laid for, they laid for you. You don't solve the problem by the State Bank of Russia intervening in the market uh, to try to prop up the ruble. That won't succeed. The answer from Islam, and we offer these words to you with some embarrassment because our own governments won't listen to us. No. Not even the Iranian government would listen to us. The answer is to do what many states in the United States have already done. The answer is to do what the state of Israel has already done. There are precedents. Namely, you make gold and silver coins legal tender. That's all. Make gold and silver coins legal tender. Russia has enough gold to mint the coins. And when you make gold and silver coins legal tender, the implication would be any shopkeeper would have the right would have the obligation to accept gold and silver in payment for goods. Any worker will have the right to ask for his salary to be paid to him in gold and silver. And as the Russian people see that gold and silver is storing value and holding value, it has integrity as money, it has intrinsic value which is stable. Whereas the ruble is constantly falling in value, the good money will eventually replace the bad money. And as more and more people hold on to the good money, the money which is solid money, which is halal money, inflation disappears. There's no such thing as rising prices except on the basis of demand and supply. These are gentle words that we share with Russia. Now, for Russia's tryst with destiny. The Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, spoke about the Malhama, or the Great War. He said, Umran ubayt al-Maqdis qarabu yatrib. That when Jerusalem is built up and flourishing, look, to Medina to see when will Medina be lying in ruins, in forlorn dissolution. Karabu yatrib khurujul malhama. When Medina is lying in ruins, is it ISIS which is going to do that? When Medina is lying in ruins, when Medina is in forlorn desolation, that will be the time when the malhama will occur. We are now on the doorstep of the malhama. It is inevitable that Russia will be attacked. Inevitable. It's just a matter of time. And that will be the Malhami because it's going to be nuclear weapons. How do we know it's nuclear weapons? Because the Prophet said they will fight over that mountain of gold. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. That can't be conventional warfare. 99 out of every 100 being killed has to be nuclear warfare. And there could only be one nuclear war in, in history, only one. So the Malhama is the nuclear war that is coming. 
We know it's coming because our prophet prophesied it. I was thinking that perhaps it might be five or ten years away. But then I had a dream. I shared it with you. I was in Iran for a conference in September. And the dream occurred twice in the same night. I normally do not share my dreams with the public. No. But I've done it on this occasion. Because I believe the dream was sent to me, so I should convey it to others. I saw a nuclear war. I saw nuclear missiles being shot into the sky. Twice in the same night. And then I saw Pakistan was a part of it. Because those who want to keep on ruling the world so they can deliver the rule of the world to the state of Israel cannot allow the world of Islam to have nuclear weapons. So Pakistan cannot, cannot be allowed to remain a nuclear power. Not possible. Since they've not got a chance to attack Pakistan so far, they're going to use the opportunity of nuclear war to attack Pakistan. At that time, Pakistani people, Dua is not going to help. Not while you have these traitors ruling over you who are Saudi clones and who wage war on behalf of the enemies of Islam to kill innocent people. To kill innocent people saying that they are terrorists without even giving the boy a chance to be defended in a court of law. Does Islam allow you to do that? Does the state have the right to kill people? That's what you just did two days ago to the son of a great sheikh. I knew that sheikh, Sheikh Gulshir Shukri. He was an elder brother to me. I loved him very much. He was a learned man. He was from Guyana in South America. Molana Fadur Rahman Ansari, who was my teacher, chose Gulshir to be his student. Wanted Gulshir as his student. Instead, Imran became a student. And so Gulshir had an on Sheikh Gulshir had an honorable place in the world of Islam. And this was his son. Why did he not have a chance to go in a court of law and be tried for the, the accusations that have been launched against him? No, you kill him. You kill him. So he doesn't have a chance to be defended in a court of law. That's why. That's what the government and uh, Pakistan Armed Forces did. So when the time comes for the attack to be launched on Pakistan, I wonder whether Dua will help on that day. The heavens must be so angry with those who rule over Pakistan today. Not just the Pakistani people detest you. The Pakistani people detest you. And when they have a chance, they lynch you. It's the heavens above also who detest you. So the Malhama is coming. And now we turn to Russia's tryst with destiny. We've spoken of it before. But maybe the Russian people didn't hear it. So today we've titled this lecture Islam and Russia's Tryst with Destiny so that it will attract the attention of the Russian people. That our prophet said, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. That when the Malhama occurred, the, occurs, the next thing that will happen will be the conquest of Constantinople. What could be the military significance of a conquest of Constantinople? And who will do it? It's a Christian-Muslim alliance that will do it. Why? Because NATO today controls Constantinople. That's why. So long as this Turkish government is in power, they can never leave NATO. Not at all. <laughs> I would be tremendously surprised to see this, this government of Turkey making any effort to take NATO, Turkey out of NATO. That's their Islamic credentials, their so-called Islamic credentials. But the question is, what military significance can there be in a world post-Malhama, a world post-Armageddon? when the world has been devastated by nuclear war, 
what possible significance can there be in a conquest of Constantinople by an alliance of Muslims in Rome? Answer, there is only one answer, only one answer. That conquest of Constantinople will break the back of NATO and liberate Constantinople from the control of NATO. So Turkey will remain a member of NATO until the Malhama. When that conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Malhama, the implication would be that the Russian Navy can now pass through the Bosphorus and the Straits of Darnadels and enter into the Mediterranean. There is no other military significance. This is the only one. And so we say to you from the world of Islam, to the Russian people, we say to you, the Russian people from Islam, that Russia will survive the nuclear war. NATO could put that in its pipe and smoke it. Russia will survive the nuclear war. And Russia will remain in naval power. There may be no more aerial warfare after that, except perhaps the state of Israel, Dajjal's flying donkey. But Russia will remain in naval power after the Malhama. And so Russia has a tryst with destiny. Why would Allah in his wisdom ordain the conquest of Constantinople after the Malhama so that the Russian Navy could pass through the Straits of Bosphorus the Bosphorus and the Straits of Danades into the Mediterranean, other than the Russian Navy has a role to play in the liberation of the Holy Land, in cleansing the Holy Land of this barbarian rubbish, the imposter state of Israel. And if these words are too powerful for them, and they want to resort to their favorite weapon of assassination. We say to them, as we've said to them in the past, and listen to me, please. You can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. And we're not afraid of death, not in the world of Islam, no. We're not afraid of death. And so Russia has a tryst with destiny. And that tryst with destiny is to ally itself with the world of Islam to liberate the Holy Land and to bring back justice and peace to the Holy Land. When truth will triumph and a Christian Muslim alliance will achieve that success. This is a time for Muslims and Christians, Orthodox Christians, to hold hands together, reach out to hold hands with each other, to build friendship and alliance with each other. And my talk tonight is meant to wake us up, wake us up. And my talk tonight is also meant to try to reach at least some of those who are joining ISIS believing that they are going on the right path to say to you, no, you have eyes and you cannot see. You're on the wrong path. Turn around and return to the Quran. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mulana innaka anta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Ameen.